Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation to come here today and to speak with you while I'm visiting um, Australia, which has been actually fantastic. I have to say I've really enjoyed my time here so far. Um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of the work we've been doing looking at innate immunity and airways disease and predominantly our work on COPD. So much of what I'm going to talk about today will be on COPD. So slightly different from what you guys do in asthma. But some of the principles are very similar. So um, the pulmonary uh, innate immune system, as, all you're all, as you're all aware, really consists of uh, mucociliary clearance, so the removal of particles and pathogens uh, along the mucociliary escalator, but also the presence of a number of cell types, including phagocytes, neutrophils, and macrophages. Now, in COPD, we know, despite we have, despite we have these protective uh, mechanisms in place, about half of the patients are colonized um, in the lower airways <coughs> with bacteria, and predominantly this seems to be Mopus influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, and Morixella cateralis. Why is those three species? We're not entirely sure, but they do seem to be the predominant species there. Interestingly, if you look at the patients with lower airway bacterial colonization, and you can, see, you can see that the patients that are more frequently colonized are the ones that also have more frequent exacerbations. So it seems to be the more bacteria you've got there, the worse your disease is. And if you look at sputum bacterial cell counts and look at the decline in lung function over time, you can see the more bacteria you've got there, the more your disease is going to progress. So there is a clear association with the presence of these bacterial species and worsening of disease. So why is this? So we know that in um, both asthma and COPD, they are chronic inflammatory lung conditions. But they are very different when you look at their inflammatory profile. And this is some work from Peter Jeffrey, who was based at the Royal Brompton Hospital, where he looked at the inflammatory cell profile in the lungs of patients who, um, well, these, these are actually people who had died either of asthma or COPD, and looked at the types of inflammatory cells you see in the lungs of people who had healthy lungs. And what you can see very clearly is that there is a massive increase in these types of macrophages and neutrophils, particularly in COPD. You don't really see this increase in macrophages in asthma, but there is a slight change, there's a subtle change in what's happening there with the macrophages in asthma. But if you remember back to the slide I've just shown you, we've got this predominance of uh, bacterial infection, and yet all these cells that are present in COPD lungs should be clear in the bacteria. So does this mean that we've got a defect in our innate immune response? So we've been looking at this in several ways. We've been looking at, firstly, how do these cells actually get into the lungs? So we've been looking at migration over the years. Um, and we've been doing this, oops. Uh, we've been doing this doing several ways. So we've been looking at basic migration assays using chemotaxis, using a very simple, very classical Boyden chamber, where you can put your chemo attractant of interest in the bottom a filter on the top and you let your cells migrate through to the filter. You can take that out and stain it and count it. Or you can do something very sophisticated and grow cells on a membrane and let cells migrate through. So essentially we've done this for several years and we've looked at the, the changes in neutrophils. Uh, we looked at the migration to two CXCR2 ligands, um, CXCL8 or R8 and CXCL1 or go alpha. And when you look at the response of cells from non-smokers, smokers and COPD, they're in yellow, blue and red respectively, you can see that we get a nice concentration dependent increase in migration to IL-8 with no difference between the groups. But when you look at the response to CXCL1, you see that we've got this enhanced migration in patients with COPD. So could this be driving some of the responses that we see in COPD? There are other ways in which you can measure uh, migration. You can do video microscopy, and again, you've got the chemo attractant down here, and you can monitor cells moving uh, in a gradient. And you can look at a vector plot, and you can see where these cells are moving. And what you can do by doing this, you can measure how accurate they are and how fast they're moving. And work from Liz Sapi and Bob Stockley in um, Birmingham in the UK have actually shown that these COPD neutrophils, we've shown that they can move more but they also show that they kind of lost their sense of direction. So this is a healthy neutrophil, <coughs> it's moving up here um, towards the chemo attractant source. But if it's a COPD cell, it kind of goes for a bit of a wonder. And it does this much quicker and it moves faster. So we think that these uh, 
these neutrophils are actually causing damage as they're moving through the tissue and they're just not moving accurately. And what Liz was able to show is that this can be corrected by a PR3 kinase inhibitor. So we've got this de defect in migration in the neutrophils that's happening in the other cells that are present in the lung. And many years ago, we were looking at the monocytes. So monocytes, again, show a very similar pattern of migration. This is Jimmy Boyd, who's in Boyd and Chambers, and this is work of Suzanne Traves, who worked with us. And you can see we get a similar response uh, to IL-8. But when we looked at the response to grow, grow alpha, again, we got this enhanced response in patients with COPD. And we subsequently went on and was able to show that this was, uh, this was due to an alteration in receptor recycling of the CXCL2 receptor in response to uh, ligation with CXCL1. So neutrophils seem to be aberrant, monocytes or PBMCs seem to be aberrant in COPD. Does it happen with any other cells and to any other ligands? Yes, this is more work more recently from Claudia Costa, who was working with us when we looked at the migration of cells towards CXCL3 agonists, including CXCL9, 10, and 11. And again, you can see this enhanced response in the cells from COPD patients. So it's like they're moving into the lungs more to the same given concentration of the chemokine that you would find there. So maybe this is accounting for the fact that we've got more of these cells in the lungs of patients, but once they're there, are they actually doing the right thing? <coughs> so we've been interested in macrophages, as Joe just said, for many, many years, and we think that they're one of the key orchestrating cells in chronic obstructive pneumonia disease. So we know that for the most part, cigarette smoke is the key driver of COPD, and we believe that they can activate the macrophages that you find in the lung, and these cells will then release and become activated and generate chemoattractants, which will bring in the neutrophils, monocytes, and CD8 lymphocytes, which are highly prevalent in the airways of these patients. And the monocytes can then generate more macrophages. Um, all of these cells can then produce a variety of enzymes and growth factors, each of which will then contribute to the three key factors of COPD, namely chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and bronchiolitis and small airway disease. We've also been able to show over the years that these cells um, tend to be glucocorticosteroid insensitive in this disease. So it could be that these are the key cells, and if we could understand what the macrophages are up to, maybe we could find a target. Um, the key role really of a macrophage, because it means a big eater, is they should be eating stuff. Um, so what we think in health is that an alveolar macrophage or, uh, will actually clear the bacteria from the airways and you would end up with maintenance of respiratory tract. We no longer believe that the respiratory tract is sterile. We think we do have a, uh, a normal microbiome in, in the lung, but in disease that that may be, become um, dysfunctional. And what will happen is that the alveolar macrophage may no longer be able to clear these bacteria. The bacteria um, drive chronic colonization, which is what we see in diseases such as COPD. And these bacteria are, no longer, are not exactly benign and they will activate the cells and you will end up with an increase in inflammatory mediators. Yep, we get that too. And we end up with this persistence of inflammation. So if we could sort this out, um, this might be a way of tackling some of this corticosteroid in, de, independent um, inflammation that we see in this disease. So what evidence do we have from that? So many years ago, we um, presented some data at the ATS actually, where we looked at alveolar macrophages and we fed them for fluorescently labelled E. coli. And what you can see here, this is how much the alveolar macrophages from non-smokers and smokers were eating. And we got a significant reduction in the amount of um, bacteria that could be taken up by the COPD cells. We kind of got scooped by Sanji Sethi's group, who a year later actually published as a paper uh, this effect of non typical haemophilus influenzae. So there is a defect in these alveolar macrophages. Now, many of you who have worked with macrophages know that you actually get an unpredictable yield of the number of macrophages you can get when you do a bronchoscopy. So over the years, we've developed a monocyte-derived macrophage model that we can use. We can predict how many cells we're going to get, and we can use this model to, um, to look at mechanism. 
But what was important, and this is some work from Craig Batista, who's a clinical fellow working with us, um, he was able to take both blood and alveolar macrophages from the same uh, people and show that actually RMDM is actually a pretty good model for what we're seeing in our alveolar macrophages. We've got a very nice correlation here. And you can see that over here, this is a bit of confocal microscopy, where we've labelled our cells cytoplasm in red and we've fed them fluorescently labelled green hemophilus in this case. And you can see that the cells take this up quite nicely and we can measure this. Also, just to note, is that not all cells will eat it. So even in a nice monocyte-derived macrophage setup, we get a heterogeneity of the responses that we see with macrophages. So we've done a lot of work using this model. Um, we've taken it forward. Um, and again, I'm just con convincing you that we are actually eating, uh, eating these bacteria. We are measuring things properly. Um, so what we have here is the cytoplasm in red and the bacteria again in green, and you can see that we've actually got internalization of the bacteria, and it's gone right inside, and we can quantify this internalization. Um, uh, just, just been a couple of slides just on asthma to show that this actually happens in asthma too. So this was some work from um, a group in the States where they looked at Agocytosis alveolar macrophages from children. So, so these were children um, with mild asthma and with severe asthma. And like I've just shown you, they gave fluorescently labelled, in this case, it was Staphylococcus aureus. This is the healthy cells who have eaten a lot of bacteria and the severe cells which haven't. And just in case people were concerned about the presence of these, the presence of inhaled corticosteroids, they use chronic cough as a control. And these children were, who were chronic coughers were also taking steroids. And what you can see, there's no effect of the steroid, but there was an effect of asthma in these children. We've gone on and looked at adults, and this is the alveolar macrophages taken from asthmatic adults. And we've looked at the response in non-severe asthma and severe asthma, and both Staph aureus and Haemophilus influenzae, we see this reduction in phagocytosis. So this effect seems to be happening in other chronic lung diseases as well as in COPD. But as I said, we've concentrated <coughs> mostly on what's happening in COPD, and this is our monocyte derived macrophage model, and in fact what you can see here is that it behaves in exactly the same way as our alveolar macrophages, and this is the response to Haemophilus influenzae, where we get this decrease in um, the phagocytosis of bacteria by the macrophages. We've looked at what happens with this, so let's look at this population of cells here. And we've looked at whether this actually relates to the exacerbation frequency in these patients. And indeed it does. So basically, if you have a COPD patient that exhibits frequent exacerbations, you will have the most reduced phagocytosis. So it does seem to be a relationship there. Um, and if you separate these patients into infrequent exacerbators and frequent exacerbators based on two or more exacerbations a year, Again, you see this significant decrease. And this is the work of Carly Bellchamber and Richard Singh, who were working as part of the COPD MAP initiative, along with uh, Peter Barnes and Bhushan Vizicha. So this is for bacteria. <coughs> what about anything else that these, these macrophages can eat? So we've had a look at apoptotic neutrophils. And again, we have a similar defect in the response to apoptotic neutrophils. And this really recapitulated the work of Sandra Hodge and her team over in Adelaide, where they first showed that alveolar macrophages from patients with COPD were not very good at taking up ap apoptotic and epithelial cells. So we, here, here we've shown it with uh, neutrophils. And it's actually not a bad correlation between the cells, whether they can eat the bacteria and whether they can eat neutrophils or not. More recently, we've actually looked as whether this could be extended to any other particles that, that these macrophages could be exposed to. And we've looked at the spores of Aspergillus fumigatus. So working with Darius Armstrong James at Imperial College, we used GFP labeled spores of Aspergillus. And again, with these macrophages, the COPD cells are actually very poor at taking them up. So there's a general defect in in recognizing any of these pathogens. I have to say what's really interesting is they, they are very good at taking up plastic beads, and that's absolutely fine, but pathogens, no. Nah. Um, we've looked at a whole variety of potential correlations or confounders, 
And to cut a long story, very long story short, we've never found any correlation with lung function, any smoking history, whether patients are smoking or not, or whatever drugs they're taking. So that doesn't seem to be impacting on any of these responses. Um, I showed you the data on the uh, with exacerbation frequency on the monocyte derived macrophages. Is this also true of alveolar macrophages? Well, yes, it is. So this is work from um, Sheffield with David Dockerell and Laura White, and they were based there. They're now in Edinburgh. And again, this was part of the COPD map collaboration. So we were collaborate. We were all collaborating together on this project. And in this case, they looked at the phagocytosis of Streptococcus pneumoniae. Um, and this is the response in healthies, and this is in the COPD patients. And they compared non-frequent and frequent exacerbators based on exactly the same criteria as I used previously. And please note that this is a log scale. Um, and again, they showed this decrease. They also showed it if they opsonized the bacteria. So whether the bacteria were opsonized or not, the pattern remained the same. So we still have this decrease in hydrocytosis. Does this happen? Uh, is this just to do with tobacco smoking? Is this just to do with COPD? Um, so we've been looking and working with a group in India with Sandeep Salvi at the Chess Research Institute in India. And just to put this into perspective, um, the exposure to biomass fuels and indoor air pollution is a massive problem. Probably half the world's population are actually exposed to biomass. And this really is compared to about a billion smokers in the world. So this is a much bigger issue. Um, as I said, about half their population are exposed to it, and there's probably about 2 billion ki kilos of biomass burned every day. And we know that in developing countries, non-smoking COPD accounts for probably more than half of the COPD that you see. And we think it's associated with biomass fuels predominantly. And by and large, it's been neglected. So, as I say, we've been looking with um, Sandeep uh, Saldi over in India. And this is some work from Bashak Yosh, who was doing a PhD um, and was working in our lab and with um, Sandeep out in Pune. And again, she looked at the bacterial load. So this, we looked at Haemophilus influenza, we also looked at other bacteria. Um, so we looked at non-smokers, in sputum of non-smokers and healthy smokers, so there was an increase. Um, and in people who are healthy but exposed to biomass, so that's about the same. But when you looked at the patients who have biomass-induced COPD or tobacco smoke-induced COPD, they had this increased bacterial load. Um, they also saw it with strep pneumonia and myxoma as well. So what happened to the phagocytic response of the MDMs in these patients? Well, it would be as you kind of predicted, that we got this decreased phagocytosis of Haemophilus influenzae, um, with these biomass exposed COPD patients, very similar to the cigarette smoke um, COPD patients. So this seems to be a defect that isn't it's associated with chronic lung disease. So is it because we've got different macrophages? Um, and I'm not going to give a macrophage talk without even touching on the possibility of different macrophage phenotypes. Um, <laughs> So most of, the, most of the work I've shown you has been on MDMs, but we've also had a look at um, uh, lung tissue-derived macrophages. And we take human lung tissue and we separate out macrophages using purple. Um, and we can go, it's a quite old-fashioned method actually, so we can go from high density to low density. And the literature suggests that the high density ones are younger and the older ones are much lighter because they've degranulated and released things that they need to do. So we've had a look at this and what we found is that those top two layers are actually mostly apoptotic and we concentrated on the next three layers. And morphologically, they don't look any different on the microscope. Um, so we've had a look at some markers on these. So Deschatel, a couple of years ago, tried to identify different macrophage populations that you'd find in lung tissue. Um, so she pulled out the uh, dendritic cells, which are CD1, C, CD1, A positive, um, and then the monocyte derived to dendritic type cells, which are 2 S6, either had 1C, well, they both had 1C, and one of them had 1A. But we were looking at the macrophages, and what she identified was they were 2 S6 positive, which is the mannose receptor. They were CD14 positive, although our the only macrophages were slightly less. The tissue ones were CD16 positive, and they were CD64 positive. 
So previously, we've been looking at our macrophages using a very similar flow cytometry strategy using HLA-DR as our, as, as our uh, starting point, where 99% of our cells were HLA-DR positive, and then looking at 1460. We then went on to look at CD163, which is a, uh, a scavenger receptor, uh, CD40, which is a T-cell co-receptor, and CD206, which is the managed receptor. And looking at these, we looked at all those different cell fractions we pulled apart, and in fact, we actually didn't see any difference in any of those cell fractions. But what we did find is that when we looked at the flow cytometry of cells taken from the tissue of non-smokers, we found that most of the cells were predominantly 1460, uh, 14 positive, 16 negative, which is kind of like the RBO map page. Um, they were 163 positive, which was great because that means that they're nice resolving map pages, uh, 40 negative, and all 2 s positive, which actually ties in very nicely with what Desh said. When we looked at what happened in the COPD cells, actually we got a completely different pattern. So instead of all being 1460, uh, 14 positive, 16 negative, actually they're not, they're a whole mixture of things. Interestingly, they're 163 negative, so they're highly activated, um, towards almost like a classically activated macrophage. Um, we're 40 negative and 206 positive. Um, so they're completely different. They were a completely different phenotype. They didn't fit any, they didn't fit any of these M1, M2 macrophage ideas that people have. You had at the time or even since. Um, so we wanted to know really why are they different? And um, was this due to the fact that we had different monocytes? We already know that the monocytes were behaving differently. The migration um, patterns were different. Were they different? So what we think is happening is that monocytes can migrate from the blood into the lung tissue, the chemokines become the macrophages. We also know that if you are exposed to high levels of LPS from bacteria and also in COPD we get high levels of interferon gamma, you can drive macrophage phenotype into a pro-inflammatory type phenotype which will be producing lots of TNF alpha and L8. Um, that would recruit the neutrophils, you get more MMPs and the antibiotic species and elastase and probably drive some of the disease processes I talked about earlier. If you had a more resolving macrophage in the presence of R4 or R13, you would have high expression of 163 and produce lots of IL-10 and then reduce some of the inflammation that you're seeing. But we think that they can change. We can change between these two phenotypes depending on the microenvironment that you have there. Um, so we've had a look at this. So we've been using our monocyte-derived macrophage model to see whether we can look at differences and you can drive differentiation using either GMCSF or MCSF down to these two extremes and then you can stimulate either with LPS or IR4. Um, and we can see we can identify any differences in whether we get any differences in plasticity or phenotype in the COPD cells. And to do this we've been looking at cytokine outputs and phagocytosis. Um, we started off really by looking at cell surface receptor in the monocytes to see whether we had a different monocyte population to start with. Um, and I'm sure of all of you are aware that in humans we have three monocyte populations based on CG1416 expression. So you have the classical ones which are highly expressing 1416, intermediate, highly 14 expressing, um, 16 expressing, and the non-classical which have a lot of CG16. And really, there was a poster at the ATS in 2013 suggesting that there wasn't a switch in these, um, in these populations in COPD. However, when we had a look at it, in fact, we couldn't see a difference. Now, it might be that we've got low numbers, but we certainly couldn't see any pattern coming up saying our monocytes were different in as, in as much as the expression of any of these populations were concerned. As I said, we were using our monocyte-derived macrophage model, so we could um, push our macrophages down one way or another, whether they're pro or anti-inflammatory. Um, and just to show you as some evidence of this, if we did uh, phagocytosis, the GMCSF macrophages, we did haemophilus influenzae, but the MCF even more, and this is what alveolar macrophages do, so the Gs are more like Ms. Uh, so, so the Gs are more like alveolar macrophages, both for uh, haemophilus and for strep pneumoniae. And if you did a cytokine output and stimulated these cells with uh, LPS, 
we can see that the GMCSF derived cells produce lots of TNF alpha with the MCSF diode, these are the same donors, um, whereas the MCSF produced lots of R10 and the GMCSF diode. So you can, we can really have a nice model where we can play with these cells now and push them one way or another. So this is work of Amy Day, who was doing a PhD with us, and what she did was she blew her cells up either in GMCSF or MCSF, and then looked at plasticity by just swapping them over and then seeing what happens at the end point. So what she found, and this is looking at phagocytosis, is that this is the non-smokers in yellow, and as you took the cells from being in GMCSF into MCSF, we got an increase in phagocytosis. We did not see this happening with the COPD cells. We got a little bit with the smokers, but not with COPD cells. If you took the healthiers and you put them from MCSF into GMCSF, you could switch the phagocytic response off. But again, not a lot happened with the COPD patients. So you could push it one way in the healthiers and you could switch them off. COPD ones didn't really want to change at all. What about cytokine output? So at uh, the GMCSF, they're producing lots of TNF alpha. But if you take the healthies and the smokers and you put them into an MCSF environment, they start becoming anti-inflammatory and producing less TNF alpha. You don't see that with the COPD cells. In fact, they stay highly inflammatory. And if you go the other way, again, the COPD cells stay highly inflammatory. So we get this highly inflammatory um, macrophage in COPD that doesn't seem to be wanting to change. And what's even clearer is when you look at the effect of IL-10, if you go from the GMCSF into the MCSF, the healthy cells produce loads of IL-10, whereas the COPD cells really don't. And again, you can switch off the healthy cells if you go from MCSF to G. So they have a plasticity that is not seen in COPD derived cells. So we've lost this plasticity that we see in disease. We can push them into a pro-inflammatory state, but we can't make them anti-inflammatory. We've had a quick look at some of the transcriptional regulation of some of these pathways. Um, so looking at LPS, interferon, gamma, and IL-4, and we know that a whole variety of transcription factors are required. And because we saw this big effect with IL-10, we've concentrated on CMAF. And we looked at the expression of CMAF in our cells um, using RT-PCR as we swapped from one phenotype to the other. And as you may expect in the cells from non-smokers, as you go from the high IL-10 expressing cells into your low IL-10 expressing cells, we can see that we can switch off CMAF expression. And if you go from the ones that don't really express IL-10 and making them express IL-10, we increase CMAF. We don't really see that to that extent in what goes on in the smokers or COPD patients. So we've got a skew in this um, effect. And not only are we not seeing expression of CMAF um, particularly well, what we've done here is we've done some immunocytochemistry. Um, we've got the uh, nucleus in blue and the CMAF is in the cytoplasm. Actually, it's coming up quite nicely with COPDs. When you stimulate these cells with IL-4, we get co-localization in the nucleus of the healthy cells, but they do not co-localize or move in the COPD cells. So we're not really getting switching, and they're not actually, even if you've got it there, it's not actually going into the nucleus. So we're not getting any IL-10 being produced, or very little IL-10 being produced in COPD cells. Okay, so that was nice, wasn't it? Because that was all in, we can manipulate our MDMs. Can we do this in real macrophages that you take from the lung? So this is work from Jessica Tillman, um, who's just finished her PhD. And we took cells, our tissue macrophage population, uh, and we exposed them to either GMCSF or MCSF, or need it alone. And we did that for six days to see whether we can switch them. And essentially, um, if we look here at IL-8, actually, they didn't really do much. So these are the cells six days in media, six days in GMCSF containing media, six days in MCSF containing media, and actually there was no difference. Where we did see a difference was um, when we looked at TNF-alpha. So if we looked at the TNF-alpha output, we saw a massive increase in the amount of TNF-alpha that could be released from the cells that have been cultured in GMCSF. So again, we're switching to this pro-inflammatory phenotype. But we couldn't, um, but then nothing happened to them when they were in the MCSF media. In fact, it stayed about the same as the control. So we can switch them on, we can go one way, but we can't switch them off again. 
we looked at the phagocytic response, and in this case, unlike the MDMs, we could not manipulate it. So there were some differences between um, between the MDMs and the tissue macrophages. So again, we were getting high ink uptake of bacteria by the healthies, but not necessarily by the macrophages from smokers and patients with COPD. So what's causing this? So there's been lots of ideas over the years about what could be causing it. The obvious one is that you've got down regulation of specific receptors on the cell surface, possibly driven by the presence of cigarette smoke. And people have looked at this and have shown reduced expression in various receptors in RVO and macrophages from COPD and smokers, including Sandy Hodge. There's lots of whole variety of things. Um, it kind of depends on when you look at your macrophages, really, as to whether they go up or down, to be perfectly honest. Um, we haven't seen those patterns, but we've seen some other things, and I'm going to talk about that uh, in a moment. Um, there are other, other exogenous factors that could be driving this. Um, Brian Oliver, who is just down the road in Sydney, looked at the effect of rhinovirus, and he looked at um, healthy alveolar macrophages and exposed them to rhinovirus, and then gave them macrophages beads and saw no difference in the phagocytic response. But when he gave them E. coli, he was able to suppress it. So we've been looking at this with Lydia Finney, um, working again with Bisha Vizicha and Sebastian Johnson over at St Mary's at Imperial College, where we've taken our MDM model and exposed them to human rhinovirus at different concentrations, and we're able to show that we had a suppression of phagocytosis, and we're able to recapitulate this with poly-IC, uh, <coughs> suggesting that this is a whole light receptor-mediated event. And again, we've also confirmed that we can see this also with alveolar macrophages from COPD patients. So these are really already bad, and we can actually make them worse by exposing them to viruses. So that could be one thing that could be happening. Um, what about an, an exogenous oxidative stress? COPD is known to have high levels of exogenous oxidative stress in the airways. And this is working in the bowel chamber, where we've just given ourselves um, hydrogen peroxide and we whack them with oxidative stress. And they're alive, they're happy. <coughs> you can see that you get a suppression both in the healthy and the COPD cells if they've been grown in uh, of their phagocytic response, whether they're MCSF or GMCSF derived macrophages. So an exogenous oxidative stress can also drive this. Other possible mechanisms, we've looked through a whole branch of different mechanisms. One of the ones we've been looking at um, is the uh, sphingosine pathway. So ceramide um, can be broken down into sphingosine, uh, which can be phosphorylated to, dry, uh, to become a sphingosine 1-phosphate. Um, and this is supposed to be a protective mechanism to prevent apoptosis. But what we've been able to show is that sphingosine one phosphate can also suppress the phagocytic response. Um, and why is this important? Because it's actually uh, elevated in the sputum of patients with COPD, and the macrophages themselves can make it. So we have a higher level of S1P knocking around in the uh, airways of these patients. So. Is it really going through that, that pathway and therefore can you block it? So there are several, there's five different receptors um, for S1P and we've looked at we're using antagonists against S1PR2 and S1PR3. And in fact, in all cases, whether they're from healthy or COPD patients, we can actually improve the phagocytic response in the presence of an S1P uh, receptor uh, antagonist. And we can also improve phagocytosis if we inhibit the production of S1P using a sphingosine kinase inhibitor. So it looks like there are endogenous mechanisms that could be driving some of these, these effects. So it's probably not just one single effect, it's probably many effects that's occurring. Um, we've looked at um, how these macrophages may be changing. Let me stop this. Uh, these, these macrophages may be driving the mechanism of uptake by looking at the relationship between the microtubules and the receptors and the uptake of bacteria. So in this case, the bacteria are in blue, and you can see that they're, they're reaching out to try and grab the bacteria and bring them into the cell. And um, 
So we've looked at what is happening to the cell surface receptors, and this is after phagocytosis, and we've looked at a whole series of receptors. Um, what tends to happen in the COPD patients, as long as I've got to switch around here, um, is that they're not coming back to the cell surface. We've got a down regulation after phagocytosis. There's no difference in these at baseline after phagocytosis, we're getting this reduction. So they're staying down. So whether it's due to some of the mechanisms I've described, um, we don't know at the moment, but we're working on that. So can we make it better? So optimization, uh, yes, we can. So these are our some data from our, our group where we've looked at non-smokers and COPD patients and if you coat the bacteria, in this case it was E. coli with serum, yes you can make it better, but it never gets as good as it is in a healthy, so there's always something that's not quite right. Other people have looked at um, adding exogenous drugs and one of those proposed has been sulforaphane, which is a compound that's found in broccoli and wasabi, so eat your broccoli. Um, and what um, Harvey et al. showed is that if you uh, looked at the uptake of non type of hemophilus influenza in COPD cells, you got a response here, but you gave them some chlorophane, you could increase that response. So there are ways in which you can improve it. Um, so to summarise this little bit, um, COPD neutrophils were abnormal, as are the macrophages. The monocytes don't seem to be when you look at this markers. They are very, very, uh, COPD macrophages seem to lack plasticity. So once they're pro inflammatory, they seem to be stuck. And it could be down to a change in transcription regulation, which is something that we're looking at. They're a distinct phenotype, they're not M1 or M2. And they do have suppressed and reduced responses. What is very interesting, I think, is that these defects that you can see in least phagocytosis are also seen in MDM. So, the effects can't just be due to exogenous uh, cues that you get from the environmental cues that you get from in the lung, but you can improve. Um, so there's got to be something inherent in these cells that we still we still don't quite understand. I just want to finish with some um, work that we're doing, uh, also looking at other aspects of innate immune responses. So this is work from Seb Johnson's group um, from Patrick Marley, where he's looking at experimental exacerbations. Um, and they were giving their, their patients viruses. And what they showed is that um, you could get an increase in viral load, and then we, which would then clear over time. But as it was clearing, you've got this increase in the bacterial load in the airways, uh, which is quite interesting. And is this associated with what's happening in exacerbations of COPD, where people tend to get better, but then they get the bacterial infection afterwards. So this is the work from Bisha Vizicia's group where they've done exactly the same thing looking at nat nat natural exacerbations. So these were people who turned up on day one of an exacerbation and did not have any bacteria in their sputum but had um, human rhinovirus could be detected. And what they found is the virus viral load went down, bacterial load went up. And even if those patients who had bacteria to start with, they would obviously give an antibiotics. Um, and as the viral load went down, bacteria still stayed up. So we've been trying to look at some of the mechanisms maybe as what could be going on here. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in the literature is that epithelial cells can actually take up bacteria and they can take it up pretty well. So these were airway epithelial cells grown from non-smokers and COPD patients and again if we fed them our haemophilus influenzae. Um, and over time you can see that the healthiest in yellow take these up and the COPD patients in red take up significantly more. And this is not just that they're sticking to the outside, again we've done confocal to show you that they're actually inside the cell. So we are getting uptake, it takes a lot longer than it does with a macrophage, but they go in. And what's incredible is that they go in and they stay alive. So it's almost as if the epithelial cells are acting as a reservoir now for our bacteria. Um, these are small airway epithelial cells that we've isolated from lung tissue. Um, we get exactly the same sort of data from strep pneumoniae, but we don't see it through E. coli. So there's something about respiratory pathogens that seem to want to go into these epithelial cells. We've had a look at some of the pathways that may be involved in this. 
So we've looked at PI3 kinase activity, so you can see that we can activate PI3 kinase over time uh, with two different isoforms of phosphorylated, um, and this is the total. But we can block this effect with a PI3 kinase inhibitor, um, which we've done here. And if we add a PI3 kinase inhibitor into that system, into their COPD cells, we can block uptake of these bacteria. So this is our current final sort of idea of what could be going on in the COPD airway. We know that we've got impaired mucociliary clearance and lots and lots of mucus knocking around and we have lots of macrophages. So our bacteria come along and our macrophages try and eat them, we don't really. So we have lots and lots of bacteria present and they multiply and you get colonization. Okay, it brings your neutrophils in and the neutrophils are like, yeah, okay, we're there. And people get an exacerbation and um, yeah, we've got lots and lots of these bacteria. And these bacteria then decide they're going to go and hide because they're not being eaten. They're going to go and hide in the epithelial cells. You can give your patients your antibiotics and you can get rid of your, well, a, lot, a lot of the bacteria there. They're still hiding. Patients can then come along and get a viral exacerbation. It will kill the epithelial cells and then start releasing these bacteria back and we can get colonization. Um, I haven't really gone into today, but the, the, there are issues with the neutrophils as well. And um, what will happen is the neutrophils will become apoptotic, and the macrophages are not very good at clearing the apoptotic neutrophils either. They'll become necrotic, they will die, they will cause damage. The macrophages will change phenotype, they will become very pro inflammatory, and they will activate the whole system. We've got this whole mess of inflammation that we see in COPD. So that's where we are at the moment, and we're trying to work towards the different ways of targeting various aspects of this. Um, I would just like to thank the various people who have done this work over the years, uh, particularly Richard Singh, Kylie Barchamber, and Peter Fennick. So Kieran did some of the macrophage work originally, and Amy. Um, this is Team Macrophage, you can follow us on Twitter, and this is us at the wedding, uh, from two Team Macrophage members, so this lady, this lady and this this gentleman here got married, so we're also marriage brokers. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to uh, thank my um, uh, collaborators over in Pune in India and all our funders, and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much a fantastic talk, Louise. Well, now I have some, time for some questions. And because we've got a webinar, if there's anyone who wants to ask questions, will you let us know, Steve? Okay, so Andrew? Thanks a lot, um, The epithelial cells that you showed, are they differentiated or are they? No, so, they, so they're just, um, the ones we've shown are actually, because uh, we just took pictures of, were actually just, uh, uh, Submerged culture. We have actually done that. We've done the same thing with differentiated cells. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's what I want to know. <laughs> yeah. um, I do have a second question, so I'll make it quick. Do you feel that the decreased ability for chemotaxis, um, as well as the decreased ability to phagocytopose um, uh, bacteria, are linked? Do you yes. feel that there is, yeah, there's a yeah. receptor? So I, think, I, I don't think it's a I think it's the way in which the cells move and change shape and grab things. It's yeah. probably, it's it's probably more to do with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, it's, it's well-known chemotaxis. Yeah. Yeah. Peter? Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Have you had a look at macrolides in your systems? <laughs> yeah, gosh, we've looked at loads of macrolides in this system, <laughs> um, including um, really a whole bunch of novel macrolides that uh, and we don't see any effect in macrolides. Believe me, we have tried macrolides, we have tried new macrolides, we've tried old macrolides, we have tried every macrolides for every different time point you can imagine and they have no effect. We've had, we can't see any effect on phagocytosis at all or any of the other, uh, even as an anti- well, that's not entirely true. Some of them, if you leave them long enough, you can get, um, so clitoromycin, you can get a bit of an anti inflammatory effect um, on macrophages. But actually, yeah, no, we don't see much. Yeah, so I'm just wondering about 
the relationship between the viral infection and the mechanisms you were showing. Certainly for rhinovirus, you're not really going to have a lot of infection in the small airways, if anything, and it doesn't yeah. cause a lot of um, epithelial apoptosis. In fact, it probably suppresses epithelial apoptosis. Maybe influenza would be more acute to what Well, that's what, and that's what I have got some info. That, that's exactly what we're going to be doing next. So we've got some working with Carl Staples in Southampton. Um, um, we, we've got some influenza virus to see if, whether we get exactly the same effect okay. um, because that's key, I think. Yeah, and you've got also, that out. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You've got two different pathological outcomes. You've got emphysema, which is disruption, small airways, yeah. and your, yeah. um, and you've got bronchitis, which is a very different thing. It wasn't so clear to me from your final model which aspects of that pathology. Honestly, we don't. Are into. They probably play into a bit of both because patients will not have one or the other. Patients will have a mixture. Um, but we think CFE actually starts in small airways. So the idea would be that that would be the initial insult. But because it takes so long, the effects will then sort of go both up and down the airway. But we think the small airway is probably the initial insult. Um, yeah, it's a nice model, I don't quite know, but yeah, you're right with getting off the, the, um, uh, the influenza virus, that's exactly what we're doing. <laughs> Just got the MTA side. Good. I'm going to ask a quick <laughs> question and then Mike can be next. Um, Louise, you said you'd looked at macrolides in terms of um, influences on phagocytosis. Have you looked at um, other common respiratory therapies? Such like, have you looked at the impact steroids. of say, steroids might yeah. have on these? Oh gosh, yeah, we've looked at steroids. So when we very, very first started doing it, so Abigail Taylor, that's what we did, we looked at steroids and we got a bit of an improvement with budesonide in our system. So subsequently we've tried to look at that and taking that apart and actually the differences that you see are, uh, it turns out to be quite tiny and the more and more you do of these, it's actually quite a small effect. You don't see it with fluticasone, so it seems to be a class effect with the drug with budesonide rather than with fluticasone. Um, but mostly you don't see anything. So nothing. Beta agonists, we thought we would get an inhibition of phagocytosis because anything that elevates cyclic AMP you would expect should inhibit phagocytosis. In fact, we've looked at both short acting and long term and long acting um, beta agonists and we don't see any effect on that either. So we've also looked at teotropia. We've looked at um, oh, what's the other one that Peter goes on about all the time? Um, theobro theobromine, yeah. Yeah, nothing. So we've looked at a whole we basically just put a lot of drugs through these yeah. through these assays and just see what they see what they do. Um, mostly, they don't do a lot. It's the bottom line, bottom line to that. Mike had a question. Um, can you speculate as to what the mechanism is whether like you're systemic? Yeah. So I don't. So the reason why we the reason why I don't think it's a specific receptor is because it's too many. If there's too many prey. For it to be one receptor because it's not. And phagocytosis doesn't work as a single receptor anyway. It, it works as a having a whole group of receptors that then come together and forms the phagocytic curve and actually push a whole load, you push things like CD45 out of that curve. So it's, so it's got to be, an, so it could be an energy driven, driven process. So one of the things I haven't shown today is that there is a problem with the mitochondria. So the mitochondria are not as, um, they don't seem to be producing, they don't seem to be working properly basically. So there is a mitochondrial defect, so it could just be that they haven't got the energy to do anything. Because if you look, if you follow the time courses, they can eat, they just do it much slower. So it's almost as if they, or they become full up quicker. So it's not that the processes that aren't there, or they haven't got the receptors, because they do, they just don't want to do it. So we've either got a exaggerated stop signal, and no one actually knows what the stop signal is for bacteria uptake. Um, or they're basically running out of energy and they can't actually do the grabbing, which is probably the way we're going with it. Yeah. <coughs> um, from a clinical point of view, there are some patients that are a bit similar to skip deeper than they smoked. Uh, patients with uh, bronchitis or bronchitis uh, will clearly some 
Sometimes okay. it's like spontaneous flare-ups with more flame. Than so we haven't looked. So what about the first problems? It might say something about the you know, yeah, so we haven't looked. We haven't looked at um, bronchiectasis or non-CF bronchiectasis. Um, so that's something that we're interested in. Certainly in cystic fibrosis, we know that the macrophages are also really bad at um, taking up pathogens, possibly down to the amount of proteases alone is taking off receptors off the cell surface. We don't think it's that because we can still just detect the receptors on the cell surface in COPD and, and, and even other diseases. So we don't just think it's that. Um, but yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that. So. I mean, you wonder why some patients can smoke all their lives and they never start having cotton to put in or COPD, and others are very susceptible and might say something about it. So we, we wanted to use this as some kind of susceptibility um, test so whether we could predict, but no one seems to want to give us the money to do that. Because we thought we could do it. It didn't yes. be quite that <laughs> yet. I think we have to prove it a bit more. Yeah, did you have a question? As you said, they're just trying to actualize and they're doing it for them. But like, what about trying other things like galactin 3? We haven't, we haven't done the galactins. We've spoken to them. We're working together. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. One of my colleagues tried galactin 3. Uh, yeah. So we've been working. So I've been talking. We've been talking. So when Jodie came over to the UK, so she came and gave a talk to us. So we were, we've been talking about that and about whether there are other ways of doing it. So the opsonin, so it's working like an opsonin, maybe working a bit more like an opsonin. Um, but whether it's good enough, it's still. We don't know what how, how high and how much. We don't know how much you need to improve it to actually make a clinical difference. So that's that's the issue. So you can improve even healthy cells with an opsonin, um, but how much do we need to get a COPD cell better? It may not have to be all that way. It may just be 20%, 30%, I don't know at the minute. But we don't know what that is to make that clinical difference, because that's the important bit. I think last question would be Peter. How is the nearby um, marker minor the change you did? So, as part of the COPD map, doing there, um, we did a whole load of microbiome analysis on the sputum samples that came out. A lot of the patients that have been used in this were, were, were in that. Basically, yeah, the microbiome is a bit weird. I mean, what we because because we were doing it in different places across the UK. Essentially, every different place had its own microbiome within the COPD patients. And what was really weird is that you didn't change that exacerbation. So they didn't really change that much at exacerbation. So maybe strain changes, but you can't pick up on on that kind of analysis. Maybe maybe is what is actually occurring at, at those times. But we don't. It's not quantitative anyway, so it's it's a bit difficult to try and work out. So I think you're saying it hasn't changed. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't. Yeah, it was, maybe <laughs> if you lived in Leicester and you had COPD, and you lived in London and you had COPD, your microbiome was actually slightly different. And if you lived in Manchester, it was different again. So yeah, take your pick. I'm not sure what that means. I don't know what microbiome means. Well, I think um, thanks for a great discussion, everyone. And I'll ask you to join me and thank Louise for her presentation.